Just like again, uh, today uh, we'll discuss the last of the topics that I've outlined over the last uh, seven, eight weeks now. When we started talking about issues, um, we began with how to resolve the issue of Tibet um, on 17th October. And since then, over the last six, seven weeks, we have discussed on uh, issues that concerns the uh, administration in exile and the community in exile. How do we uh, strengthen all these? And today uh, we'll discuss about China's uh, policies in Tibet and how do we meet those challenges. Now before uh, we discuss uh, as to how do we meet the challenges um, posed by uh, China's policies in Tibet, uh, it's important that we understand what are the Chinese policies in Tibet. So from the time uh, Communist China began to invade uh, Eastern Tibet since 1949, China has implemented population transfer policy to assimilate the Tibetans into China, to turn Tibet into China. Uh, based on communist ideology, China has not only tried to obliterate the very identity of the Tibetan people by systematically destroying uh, Tibetan language, uh, Tibetan culture, and Tibetan religion, but have uh, also caused irreparable uh, damage to Tibetan uh, natural environment and its resources. Now, all these are very much evident from the deeds of the successive uh, leadership of the People's Republic of China. Um, of course, now uh, I have covered the subject of uh, uh, how do we resolve the issue of Tibet uh, at the first session. And there also we dealt a little bit about uh, how uh, there is no political freedom in Tibet. Uh, and that's also related to human rights issues and political uh, prisoners. So this time I'm not going to cover the political aspect of uh, China's policies in Tibet, but will rather focus more on how Chinese, successive Chinese leaders um, have practiced the policy of population transfer, which in other words is uh, the demographic aggression. And uh, uh, what are the educational policies concerning Tibetan language uh, they have followed and then on the Tibetan religion and uh, environment. So, uh, but we don't have enough time to talk about each and every policy that were uh, set by the Chinese policy over the last 70 years. So I'll go through very briefly just to give you a very graphic understanding of what were the policies that culminated in what Tibet uh, is today, uh, how it has evolved over the uh, generations from Mao Zedong's time when Mao was in charge from 1949 to 1976 until his death. Then Deng Xiaoping's time from 1978 to 1993 till his death, irrespective of whether he was holding any official post or not, but he was the paramount leader during that time. And then during Jiang Zemin's time, 1993 to 2003, and Hu Jintao's time from 2003 to 2013, and then Xi Jinping's period uh, from 2013 to now. <clears throat> so first, uh, the reason why I'm taking, uh, why we need to go into the details of understanding what are the Chinese policies in Tibet, is because when we talk about how do we handle, how do we meet those challenges, how do we face those challenges, Unless we understand China's policies in Tibet, it's difficult for you, for us to understand uh, how do we meet those challenges. So the first issue I'll take up is the demographic aggression. Now, during Mao Zedong's time, uh, many Chinese, ordinary Chinese, followed the Chinese military um, to, uh, uh, you know, for the exploitation of Tibet's natural resources, to build uh, roads, to set up industries, and uh, you know, uh, killing of Tibetan wildlife—that is, Tibetan fauna. 
and deforestation and uh, many other unscrupulous uh, activities through brutal means that rendered both the people and the land of Tibet into tatters. Then during Deng Xiaoping's time, uh, uh, the party secretary was also Hu Yaobang and uh, under Hu Yaobang's leadership, uh, he decided that the situation in Tibet has gone down from pre-1959, uh, before uh, uh, we had to flee into exile. So he decided that uh, to improve the situation inside Tibet, uh, he has to repatriate 85% uh, of the Chinese uh, population from Tibet. And that was the one brief time when uh, the demographic aggression was decelerated. Uh, the Chinese population in Tibet was reduced. Uh, that was the only time. Then during Jiang Zemin's time, uh, then he developed this plan called the Western Development Plan. Now in the name of developing the Western Hemisphere of Chinese area, uh, which is now Tibet and other areas in Uyghur, so in the name of development, now many more Chinese were sent into Tibet. And that was the beginning of uh, major Chinese population transfer into Tibet. Then during Hu Jintao's time, then he built the railways that linked uh, mainland China with Tibet. Uh, when he established railways in 2007 from Kormo to Lhasa and uh, you know, now they are going to expand into, they have already expanded up to Shihutse. So that was the beginning. And because of the because of the railways uh, that connected uh, Tibet with the main, mainland, now many more Chinese came in the beginning of uh, this century. Um, so today, during Xi's time, China, Tibet, uh, Tibet has become an opportunity for the Chinese to make a living. So more and more Chinese are coming into Tibet, wherever they, ha they have economic opportunities. Um, and uh, Tibetans have become just object uh, for Chinese uh, tourist attraction. Uh, as of today, uh, we don't have the exact number. The latest uh, was 2010 demographic survey, and by the end of this year, or by the beginning of next year, uh, we will know what the Chinese uh, demographic 2020 census uh, talks about Chinese population into Tibet but we can safely say that the Chinese population in Tibet had already outnumbered the Tibetans in Tibet. Then next, I will take up the issue of religion, the Tibetan Buddhism. Now during Mao's time, now after the signing of the 17-point agreement under duress, uh, we were forced to sign the 17-point uh, agreement uh, under the threat of war. Um, in 1951, China followed a policy of uh, deception, uh, lies, and false promises, and they laid bare their real intentions by brutal persecution, uh, torture, and incarceration, and killings, despite the fact that uh, we tried to live under the provisions of the 17-point agreement for the uh, eight, for eight years, from 1951 to 59. Um, ultimately, when the threat to the life of His Holiness the Dalai Lama became very imminent, then we had to fly into exile. Uh, we had to we had to flee flee into exile. Then Mao followed uh, with uh, democratic uh, reforms, and that was followed by the you know the three years famine and. Uh, uh, followed by cultural revolution for 10 years from 1966. So that caused a lot of damages to Tibetan monasteries. Some 6,000 Tibetan monastery institutions were destroyed during that period and indiscriminate desecration of thousands of years old Buddhist uh, statues and scriptures and uh, uh, anything related to Tibetan Buddhism. So during the Cultural Revolution, anything, everything old was destroyed. So uh, then that was followed by Deng Xiaoping. Uh, not long after the death of uh, Mao, Deng, Deng Xiaoping took over. 
and there was a brief period of uh, respite. Uh, the 10th Pension Ramachaya was uh, released from uh, imprisonment and uh, uh, rebuilding of monastic institutions uh, were undertaken and the monks and nuns were given a little more freedom to practice their religion. Uh, Tibetan fact-finding delegations uh, were sent into Tibet and uh, uh, by 1984 we also sent exploratory teams to explore possible dialogue, negotiations that provided a ray of hope for resolving the Tibetan issue. However, uh, after the death of, uh, the untimely death of Benjamin Rinpoche and the Tiananmen Square massacre and the imposition of martial law in Tibet in 1989, the liberal policies also faded away. Then during Chiang Zemin's time, then he introduced more stricter controls on monastic institutions. That was the beginning of more control on monastic institutions. Uh, through, during now, during Hu Jintao's time, um, there were more permanent appointments of communist officials in the uh, monasteries, thereby uh, the government began direct intervention in the management of the monastic institutions and also getting uh, really interfering in the uh, academic uh, study of Buddhism. Moreover, during Hu Jintao's time, regulations were made, laid down to interfere with the aged old system of the recognition of Tibetan reincarnated lamas. Then during Xi Jinping's time, more Chinese officials were posted in monastic institutions for stricter control on the running of monasteries, more surveillance in the monasteries. For instance, between 2012 to 2017, in five years, more than 7,000 Chinese officials were appointed in 1,700 monasteries in Tibet Autonomous Region alone, uh, aside from the other regions of Tibetan Kamen Amdo. So likewise, movement of nuns and monks was severely restricted. Um, and uh, today uh, in Tibet, Chinese, uh, Tibetan officials and students are prohibited from visiting monasteries and they put severe curbs on the display of the photos and portraits of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, extended, extending it beyond uh, Tibet Autonomous Region in the other regions of Tibet. So this, this is uh, the, the, how they followed um, a policy uh, or stricter control on the uh, Tibetan religion. Now in terms of education, um, and their policies on uh, Tibetan language. During Mao's time, uh, of course, schools were opened, but the schools were not opened to teach regular uh, subjects. The schools were opened mainly to indoctrinate the Tibetan children with communist ideology during his time. Then during Deng Xiaoping's time, as I mentioned before, there was a little respite, and then when Benjamin Rinpoche was released, under the leadership of Benjamin Rinpoche, uh, learning, uh, studying, and usage of Tibetan language was promoted, uh, not only in Tibet Autonomous Region, but in other parts uh, of Tibet, in Amdo and Kham. So under Hu Yaobang's uh, liberal policies, there was a semblance of revival of Tibetan national identity. For the first time since uh, occupation uh, relations between Tibetans and Tibetans inside and outside were established and Tibetan became, Tibetan language became the official language for some time. Then during Chiang Zemin's time from 93 to 2003, then he adopted this uh, policy of promoting Mandarin language, uh, teaching of Mandarin language. So teaching of, of Mandarin language in schools became the national agenda during his period. Um, 
Now, of course, at the end of his tenure, there was this resumption of uh, dialogue between the Tibetans and uh, uh, the Chinese uh, leadership in 2002, but that did not uh, help uh, in uh, promoting the Tibetan language. During Hu Jintao's time, the imposition of limits on teaching Tibetan language increased, and many other programs related to education led to numerous protests by students and self-immolations in Tibet. Of course, the self-immolations were not triggered only by the education policies. There were many other reasons, but that was also one of the main reasons why Tibetans resorted to such a drastic uh, uh, action. Now, during Xi Jinping's time, Tibet as a medium of instruction was done away with. Tibetan language became just a language class. Today, in the whole of Tibet, Tibetan language is just a language class. Now, Tibetan language as a prerequisite in the entrance exam for government positions was also abolished. So massive numbers of Chinese teachers were deployed inside Tibet to administer the schools and also to enforce Chinese medium in Tibetan schools. So this is how uh, the education policy has evolved from Mao to Xi's time. Uh, on the environmental issue inside Tibet, all of us know that Tibet is the roof of the world. Uh, people, uh, you know, we ourselves call uh, Tibet as the land of cool climb, or land surrounded by snow mountains and uh, then the Westerners came, and, I, and as far as I know, in 1996, one Robert Eckwell, no, uh, Robert Eckwell, he wrote a book, uh, Outpost uh, Frontier of Tibet, something like that. In 1906, one of the chapter was titled as the Roof of the World. So since then, Tibet was known as the Roof of the World because of its altitude. And in Asia, people refer to Tibet as the fountain of Asian rivers or source of Asian rivers. So <clears throat> we all know how important it, uh, China, Tibet's environment, uh, not only for the Tibetans, but also for the whole region and globally, uh, how much impact uh, Tibet's environmental issues uh, have on uh, global climate change. So that is, uh, and the, today, of course, even Chinese scientists call Tibet as the third pole. Now, during Mao's time, uh, there was indiscriminate exploitation of Tibet's natural resources and flora and fauna, uh, deforestation, all these caused irreparable damage to Tibet's fragile ecology and environment. Now, during Jiang Zemin's time, even though deforestation was banned, so following massive destruction in China when there was this huge flood on the Yangtze in 1998, um, despite that policy, there were illegal deforestation and then um, uh, other forms of exploiting Tibet's natural resources continued unabated without any consideration to environmental safeguards. Now, during Hu Jintao's time, uh, again, when he connected Tibet uh, with mainland China through the railways, um, that accelerated uh, mining activities inside Tibet to feed what the world called as the factory of the world. You know, China was known as the factory of the world, and to produce all these materials, they needed a lot more uh, raw materials. And when they can go as far as Africa and Latin America to get that, there's no question as to why they have not exploited Tibet. So the acceleration of exploitation of Tibet's natural, natural uh, uh, re the resources happened. Uh, nomads were forcibly made to move uh, to sedentary communities by the state. Um, uh, natural progressions of human evolution happens everywhere, but when a state, uh, under the direct direction of the state, state-sponsored policies of 
removing nomads happen, that caused a lot of damage to the environment because Tibetans are the major stakeholders and they have over thousands of years lived on the Tibetan plateau and they know exactly how to maintain the natural balance. Um, but when the nomads were removed, uh, that accelerated desertification inside Tibet. Uh, by 1996, the um, uh, UNDP uh, estimated that some 37,000 uh, hectares of land are being degraded every year, which eventually leads to desertification. <clears throat> and uh, uh, massive uh, uh, damming, damming of uh, Tibet's rivers uh, continues. Uh, to this day, um, many of the downtown uh, riparian countries uh, from where Tibet's rivers flow uh, have been severely impacted. Uh, Tibetan rivers go into Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and uh, Burma, uh, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and of course uh, China. So many of these riparian countries are having serious problems. Uh, at one time, I remember when we talk about political advocacy and all that, when visitors come to Damsala, I tell them, today we are political refugees. But because of China's environmental policies inside Tibet, there could be a lot more environmental refugees in the world. And some people even say that Third World War could happen because of water. So even today, water is... Uh, a major issue when I was in Delhi as Director of Tibetan Parliamentary and Policy Research and as early as 2006-07 with our partners we organized uh, seminars on Tibet's river waters, divert, divert, uh, diverting, diversion of uh, Brahmaputra to Tibet's north by the Chinese government. At that time uh, there was very little interest by the Chinese, by the, by the Indian government or NGOs and um, organizations from the uh, South Asian nations, uh, Southeast Asian nations also from uh, through where the rivers flow. But today, uh, the urgency in addressing these issues have become much, much more prominent. Um, but we have to accept that since then, um, there have been a uh, little more interest from the Chinese government because uh, to preserve Tibet's natural environment because they know that this is very, very important for China and, China and its people. Uh, but still, uh, there is a need for a lot more improvement uh, to meet with the international standards. So when we reach out to governments, we tell them it will be uh, useful if um, uh, devel environmental scientists from development, developed countries can work with Chinese environmental uh, scientists uh, uh, to see how impacts of all this glacial uh, melting and you know uh, uh, permafrost and all these impacts on the global climate. So those kind of cooperative efforts are necessary. Uh, so this is where uh, we stand today in terms of Tibet's environment. Now to summarize all these policies on population transfer or rather Chinese demographic aggression into Tibet, uh, which poses the major uh, challenge to the Tibetans in terms of preserving our national identity. Of course, we are not against multiculturalism, but when a, a larger uh, p p uh, community uh, completely overwhelms a minority community, then there is a serious threat to the destruction of uh, the Tibetan national identity. Um, now, uh, yeah, that and then education and religion and environment. Now, when we summarize all this, except for this very brief period in the 1980s during Deng Xiaoping's time, during Hu Jintao's time, uh, the Hu Yaobang's time, and Pen Shinrin-bache's time, every successive Chinese leader had taken every measure to accelerate the pace of destroying Tibetan national identity. The Chinese leaders have always believed that 
economic development, economic development alone would satisfy the need of the Tibetan people and have failed to understand and failed to recognize that the true aspiration of the Tibetan people lies in mental peace for them to have the freedom to use their language, to practice their religion. That is what the Tibetans are really aspiring for and the Chinese leadership failed to understand that. Now when we come down to how do we face the challenges, of course Tibetans in Tibet have to bear the brunt, the direct brunt of Chinese atrocities, including threat to their own life. But despite all that, their novelty, their ingenuity and courage in organizing different forms of peaceful and non-violent protests are exemplary and worthy of praise. Um, about one half decades ago when we had Professor Jean Shap, who was an expert on non-violent uh, uh, struggles, uh, they have composed a list of actions by non-violent activists uh, from Gandhiji's time to uh, Martin Luther King to Nelson Mandela and many other non-violent struggles around the world. And there are many methods that are being adopted by the Tibetans inside Tibet that are not listed in that. So their ingenuity is uh, you know, noteworthy. So I'm not going to discuss about what they are doing to meet the challenges posed by the Chinese government because when we do that, then it does not help our cause. It helps the Chinese to curb their freedom, uh, to curb their activities. So I shall not go into the details there. Now the question is how do we Tibetans here in exile have to do? Now what will I, if you entrust me with the responsibility of Sikyong, what will I and my administration will do? That is more important. <clears throat> So first and foremost, what we need to do, what my administration will do is to conduct an in-depth analytical assessment of the Chinese policies in Tibet and its consequences on the Tibetan people. So therefore, we need to do in-depth research on uh, the population transfer. So when we say population transfer, then let's talk about, uh, then we talk about if we start from the eastern region, let's say Qinghai province. Now Qinghai province is distributed into Siling, which uh, has the status of a prefecture, and then you have Tsoshar also as a prefecture, then Tsolho is north of Qinghai, uh, the Tsongobo Lake, then south of Tsongobo Lake, west of Tsongobo Lake, which are different prefectures, and then you have the Malo, south of the Yellow River uh, prefecture, and then Yushu prefecture composes of uh, Nanshen and uh, Kihuto area, Gawa area. So these were traditionally Kham areas. Then we have in the province of Kansu, we have a small Tibetan region called the Kenlo uh, prefecture, and then a district, Pari district. So we have to look at these areas and see how many Chinese have moved in into Tibet. Then if you look at uh, Sichuan province, the uh, areas populated by Tibetans, then you have the Ngaba Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture, then you have Kanze uh, Tibetan o o Autonomous Prefecture and the Mili District. These come under the Sichuan province. Now how many people, Chinese population, have moved into these areas in Tehor, in uh, Nyaron, in Derge, in Lingsan, so all these areas in Ba, Litang, all these areas. Then we also have to look at Yunnan province, the Tibet uh, Autonomous Prefecture of Dechen, under which there are three districts of Dechen, Getang, and Balung. Even in 2010 census, if we look at Dechen Prefecture alone, the number of population of Tibetans and number of population of Chinese in that area have almost equaled. Now add to that, if you add other communities, 
of Lushi and uh, the other communities, then Tibetans are already uh, outnumbered by uh, 25 to 75 percent. So now that may have exceeded over the years because the Chen Prefecture is more known as the Shangri-La of Tibet, Shangri-La of the world. So that has become a major uh, tourist uh, attraction and more and more Chinese traders, businessmen, workers are moving in there. So we have to see there, uh, look at those areas. Now if you look in the Tibet Autonomous Region, uh, you have the Ngari Prefecture, which is the westernmost part of Tibet. Then you have Loga Autonomous Prefecture, you have Shigatse Autonomous Prefecture, you have Ningchi Autonomous Pre Prefecture, which is the Kongpo region. Then you have Chamdo uh, uh, Autonomous Prefecture, which is the uh, Western Kham region, under which you have uh, Makam, and Chungbo, and part of Shodal Hosom, uh, you have Tagaya, uh, Ma, uh, so all these areas come under that. Then you have Nakchuka Autonomous Prefecture. Then Lhasa with their auto prefecture status. So we have to look at all these and study this instead of us fighting amongst ourselves without <coughs> you know, uh, possessing any land as to which area belongs to whom. We should focus on what the Chinese government is doing. So that is why we need to do an analytical assessment of how Chinese population are moving into Tibet and how China is trying to um, sinocize Tibet. Or in other words, they use this word, signification of Tibet. Now, unless that is controlled, then we are under serious, serious threat, serious threat uh, to the Tibetan national uh, <clears throat> identity. Now, till such a time that Tibetan issue is resolved, my administration will point out all the wrong policies of the Chinese government and ask them to make it right. This is direct uh, appeal or urging the Chinese government if they really consider Tibet as part of China, then they should treat Tibet as one of their own, based on their thinking. You know, so um, till the Tibet issue is resolved, that is the reason why I say, you know, it might take a short time, it might take a longer time, and it may take a too long a time also. But in within that period, we have to. It's not because the Chinese government doesn't know, but we have to stress on the wrong policies adopted by the Chinese government, ask them to make it right. If they want to meet the aspiration of the Tibetan people, then we'll also urge the Chinese government to release all political prisoners, including Panchen Rinpoche. Now, what is Panchen Rinpoche's fault? Is it only because he was born as the reincarnation of the previous Panchen Rinpoche? So even today they claim that he finished his education, he is working, he and his family doesn't want to be disturbed. If Benjamin Rinpoche is free, why can't the Chinese government show a picture of the Benjamin to the outside world? Why are they hiding him from the public view? And the third thing what we need to do is, China is accusing us of internationalizing the Tibet issue. If Chinese government or when Chinese government does not respond to our legitimate quest for freedom, then what do we do? We are left with no other alternative but to reach out to the international community. If China is sincere about negotiation, if they decide to resolve the Tibetan issue, then there is no need for us to reach out to the international community. There is no need for them to accuse us of reaching out to the making Tibet an international issue. You know, on the one hand, they don't want us to reach out to the international community. On the other hand, they uh, rule Tibet with an iron hand. So thereby, they wanted Tibetan issue to die. That cannot happen. So it's our job, the responsibility of the Tibetans in exile, you and us. You know, to reach out to the international community, whether the Chinese government likes it or not, that doesn't matter. We have to reach out, and that we will do. Now, how do we do that? How do we reach out to the international community? If and when you entrust me with the responsibility, I, as Sikong, will lead the way in reaching out to the international community. 
because of the benevolence of His Holiness Dalai Lama and the host nations and our parents, now we are endowed with good education. We are capable of reaching out to the international community uh, in every possible way. So, as Sikyong, I lead the way, and then we have the Department of Information and International Relations, uh, the minister and the secretaries and all the civil servants under that department will also lead the way. Then we have the offices of Tibet. The whole world is divided into these zones where you have areas under the Tokyo representative, then we have areas under the Canberra representative, then you have Delhi office which has to handle from Thailand to Middle East, and then we have uh, our office in Nepal, which handles only Nepal, uh, office in Taiwan, which have uh, Taipei, which have, uh, handles only Taiwan, and then our Moscow office has to handle Mongolia and other areas. We have an office in Geneva, which has to handle, um, you know, the whole of South Southern Europe. We have office in South Africa in Johannesburg, that handles the whole of Europe. And uh, office in Brussels, which handles from Portugal to Spain to France and Benelux. Office of London, uh, from Iceland to UK to Scandinavia, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Office of Tibet in New York, that handles North America. And now we have a new office in Sao Paulo that handles South, uh, South America. So through the offices of Tibet, my administration with will give all the latest information, latest facts as to what is happening in, inside Tibet and how do we reach out to the governments, to the parliaments and what are our ask. So we will give very clear directions so that all of us all over the world are on the same page and we demand the same thing, we say the same thing based on factual information inside Tibet. So this is what my administration will do. We will increase the capacity of the China Dusk, we will increase the capacity of the Tibet Policy Institute. So Tibet Policy Institute should also focus on issues where we are competent at. There are many other issues where many experts research on different fields. But we have to be expert on our own field because we are the only people who can give the right kind of information as to what is happening inside Tibet. So that we need to do. We need to focus on issues inside Tibet. Then to add to that, since the offices of Tibet are far and few and the offices of Tibet are short-staffed, in New York office you have only about four or five people and then you have to reach out to the Tibetan communities, the New York office has to reach out to the White House, the State Department, the Congress, Tibetan communities, religious institutions and all that in two different countries. Our capacity is not enough. So what we need to do is we need to create this legion of advocates. Now we are talking about 60,000, about 60,000 Tibetans in uh, countries other than India, Nepal and Bhutan. Now if we say out of the 60,000, there are at least, uh, you know, 25% of it, uh, 15,000 Tibetans who are capable of doing advocacy work, who are dedicated to the Tibetan cause and who are willing to contribute 10, 20 days in a year, aside from making their own living to work for Tibet, then we can create this huge group of advocates for Tibet. And many of you who are now citizens of different countries also know the language of that country. So you can work with the officers of Tibet, work with the Tibetan community leadership, you know, and do this advocacy work with nations, with your own nations. Then you can also reach out to multinational platforms, including the United Nations, which the Tibetans in Switzerland are doing at the UN Human Rights Council. So by creating this legion of advocates for Tibet, we can make sure, we can make it 
uh, known to the Chinese leadership that unless the Tibetan issue is resolved, Tibetans are not going to lie low. That is what we need to do. And we will make sure that we give all the right kind of information to all these Tibetans to be capable advocates for Tibet. Now, over and above that, then we have the Tibet support groups and the parliamentary groups who will lobby with their own nations and also at multilateral platforms. And, you know, and then we can request these governments to adopt policies like what the U.S. did on Tibet, the 2002 Tibet Policy Act and the funding programs and all that. So this is, these are the areas where we can work, where we can do things. So moving forward, my administration will lead the way to pool the resources of every Tibetan, irrespective of which province or religious tradition you belong to or what political ideology you follow, whether you follow Rangzen or you follow Umelam, the, to seek redressal of the wrong policies inside Tibet is responsibility of every single one of us. That is why I always talk about equitable. So irrespective of what region, religion, whatever, what uh, uh, political ideology you follow, <clears throat> all our energies should be directed at our common opponent. That is the People's Republic of China. So through new ways and means, we have to achieve our common objective, if we can do all that. Because it's not just good enough for the administration to have a good policy. We need collective effort from every Tibetan. As His Holiness always says, every single one of us has to be the ambassador for our brethren inside Tibet. Let us do it. And as Sikong, I'll definitely lead the way we will be definitely in a position to provide you with all the tools to reach out to the international community. We will make effort to reach out to the Chinese government and then and only then we will be able to achieve our uh, common objective. So I'll stop here on this topic uh, today. Um, and I've, it has come to my notice that uh, some of my supporters are meeting and organizing uh, Sangsu and all that in different regions. So I appeal not just to my supporters, but also supporters of all other candidates that you should take care of your health. The COVID pandemic is not yet over. Vaccination has not yet come in. And uh, the reason why I'm not coming to your place is to avoid human contact, is to, for you, for your health, for your life. Therefore, I urge you, if at all you meet, uh, whenever you meet, please wear mask, please maintain social distance, uh, not spread the virus. It has come also to our notice that one of our candidates has also uh, tested positive for this, and I pray for his uh, speedy uh, recovery and I appeal to all of you to take care of your health. Don't become super spreader. Uh, keep yourself safe. Thank you so much. See you next time.